Hi, Guilty Feminist. This is Deborah. Just before we start the show, my stand-up comedy show, Brand New Hour at Soho Theatre, runs from the 30th of November to the 5th of December. There's hardly any tickets left, so go to SohoTheatre.com and grab one while you can. I really love you to be there. Also, we're recording a live episode of The Guilty Feminist at Shakespeare's Globe, but the lovely indoor winter space as part of their Women and Power season, 6 p.m. on Sunday, the 12th of December. And our guest is Kathy Lett, the legend. Now, I'm very excited to tell you about this. Sunday, the 16th of December, starting at 7 p.m., not 7.30, The Guilty Feminist presents Camp as Christmas. It will be at the Union Chapel in Islington. I will be co-hosting with Tom Allen himself. Our brilliant lineup of confirmed LGBTQ plus acts include Sandy Toxvig, the Queen, Grace Petrie, Jess Foster-Q, Jen Brister. There are other brilliant acts too, but there are some so big and exciting, I am not even allowed to announce them yet. All I will say is tickets are going to go soon. Get one now. It's a benefit for Say It Loud, run by and four LGBTQ plus refugees fleeing homophobic violence. And can do, Dr. Rola Hammond, who you heard on the podcast recently, alarming Syrian schools. Tickets are £25 or £15 concession. It is the most extraordinary lineup and it will be the best Christmas show this year. For all of these, check the links in the show notes or go to guiltyfeminist.com. And finally, we released a few days ago. Um, a podcast version of a live stream we did with Sarah Mardini and Sean Binder, who were two search and rescue volunteers who are facing trial this week for trumped up charges of trafficking in Greece. They're humanitarians. We need to support them. We need to tweet the Greek prime minister and tell him we will not stand for it. Please go to freehumanitarians.org All of the information about how you can support Sarah and Sean and the others who are up on these ridiculous charges will be there. Plus, you can donate to help their campaign. This is really, really urgent and scary. So please help if you can in any way possible. And now, the podcast. I'm a feminist, but recently my friend asked me if I'd go on a gay cruise with him. And I absolutely, you know... It's absolutely my milieu being surrounded by absolutely. hundreds of gay men adoring me, of course. And he said, you could do comedy on the cruise. And I said, mm, you know how much I love gay men. You know how much I love. I've surrounded myself. I love, I love, I love, I love, I love. But I will not go on a gay cruise with you because birds of a feather are cunts. <laughs> Now, that's Um, funnier than you gave it credit for, but some of you were uncomfortable laughing at the word cunts. That's not my fault. Cunts is a beautiful part of the body. uh, You say dicks. It's absolutely fine. So I'm going to go again, and I want you to laugh as if you're not sitting next to your mum, okay? Because your mum's not here unless she is, in which case... Was anyone's mum here? Oh, actually, your mum is here. Your mum is actually here. You've been on the podcast before, yeah? Yeah. I'm... Yeah. Okay. I wish I could do this in my stand-up. Sorry, could you just stop? Because that joke I just told you was fucking brilliant. Yeah. Go back. Here we go. Laugh. Do now. you remember those teenagers that were from Wales who were on the podcast talking about upskirting at school and trying to be feminists as young teenagers? Yeah, one of them's here. Amelia? Yeah, hi. Oh. <laughs> Amelia is the only one with permission not to laugh heartily at this joke. She's actually sitting next to her mum and she's 13. The rest of you, no, absolutely no reason not to laugh. Oh, we're doing the Except C-bomb now that there's old. discomfort that Amelia's in the audience. I see that now. I see that now. She's had a lot worse in the school grounds. Did you not hear the episode? Um, no, I won't make you do it again. It is true, though, for me, I just don't like big groups of the same sort of people exacerbate each other's worst traits. That's all I'm saying. Uh, well, look, and I, 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 can, I, I can agree with that. I, if I do gigs, I, listen, I am a lesbian. I love the lesbian. Do I want a room full of lesbians in the audience? No, I don't, because it's very hard to make a room full of lesbians laugh. Five or six, sure. 20 of them, they're like, no. Um, <laughs> why, why, why? But oh, surely I your jokes are, are not... bespoke for the lesbian. You, well, you would think. I have had... A, I, I have come off stage thinking, well, I have died an absolutely horrific death. And then a lesbian will have come up to me at the end and gone, I really enjoyed the show. And I'm like, well, tell your face, love, because I can't... 
Wow. That's, that's an I'm a feminist but for the ages. Tell your face, love. Tell you. Wow. I'm a feminist but. Um, <laughs> That's my first one. There we go. Okay. Are you? Are you? Are you got retrospect. You got back into when I'm a feminist, but I can't retrospectively say that's Done it. my first one. Listen, I can't. You were just it was a second ago. We're telling them to laugh at a joke. Fine. Even, Fine. They're, they're back Fine. tired. All I'm saying. All I'm saying is a gay cruise is wonderful. Except I know it's going to. Everyone's going to exacerbate each other's worst qualities, and I don't want to be anywhere where the punishment for leaving is drowning. <laughs> That's not unreasonable. It's not unreasonable. Well, now you put it like that, that actually seems yeah. very reasonable. If I go to Pride and it gets all a bit out of hand, I just can jump on the tube home. Do you see my point? Do you see my point? Not on a cruise, my friend. Not on a cruise. If you're on a ten-night cruise, you are on a ten-fucking-night cruise. It gets a bit too... And I don't care who it is. I don't care. Big groups of anybody. It could be... Heterosexuals. Oh, well, big groups of heterosexuals are clearly awful. Yeah. Have you had a dinner party with a big group of heterosexuals? No, I'm an Awful. Lesbian. No, okay, fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> they all talk about their accountants and their extensions on their conservatories and things like that, don't they? Big to groups be of heterosexuals. fair, I've been with big groups of lesbians who have done this exactly the same thing. Oh, and I've been going off We should probably stop stereotyping people. Um, <laughs> all right, I'm a feminist, but recently when Netflix broadcast a transphobic Dave Chappelle comedy special. My good friend Hannah Gadsby uh, wrote this on Instagram. Hey, Ted Sarandos, who I assume runs Netflix. I mean, I didn't know until she said it. Just a quick note. She probably knows him because she does specials there all the time. She She probably had drinks with him. Just a quick note to let you know that I would prefer if you didn't drag my name into your mess. This is because he released a statement going, oh, but we've also platformed Hannah Gadsby. So it's... What a bellend. For balance, you know, and name some other people. Now I have to deal with even more of the hate and anger that Dave Chappelle's fans like to unleash on me every time Dave gets $20 million to process his emotionally stunted partial worldview. She put this on Instagram. You didn't pay me nearly enough to deal with the real-world consequences of the hate speech dog-whistling you refuse to acknowledge, Ted. She's named him again. Fuck you and your amoral algorithm cult. I do shits with more backbone than you. That's just a joke. I definitely didn't cross the line because you just told the world there isn't one. And I read yes. that and thought Burn. I would have done something similar if I'd had a Netflix special, except mine would have been a bit more like, Netflix have been very good to me, so I'm saddened to see <laughs> that they have broadcast this transphobic material and asked them to reconsider. Naughty. I've always found Ted Sarandos <laughs> to be an open-minded but also compassionate <laughs> giver of millions of pounds for specials and I hope to get another one to platform non-transphobic views I would love to share that space uh, with a transgender person Ted I'm correcting you publicly but also don't stop giving don't me millions stop giving of me specials. pounds <laughs> I hope I wouldn't have done that I hope I would have done something more like what Hannah did but I, I, I don't know want to that lie I and say Amoral algorithm, algorithm cult. Algorithm cult is it's pretty harsh. Amoral algorithm cult. I would have said, let's have a little chit chat. And uh, I mean, my career's not going well enough for me to be having a go at anyone, really. But I mean, I still do that. But uh, that's probably why the career's not going very well. But you know, um, <laughs> your career's going very well. It's You're always going on the television. Absolutely. A- a- ke- you have the television you don't on. watch television, Deborah. I don't, you only but watch I... Succession. <laughs> That, listen, I don't only watch Succession, but I do watch a lot listen, of that kind of box set in America. My career is going A-OK, but if you comparatively to Hannah, oh, Hannah is well, at a place where career is can... going well as, ha- yeah, Hannah Gadsby. In a way, she's got more to lose than me because I don't have a Netflix special. Do you see what I mean? So she's had two. I don't know if she wants a third. I think she could pop over to Amazon Prime <laughs> and say hello. I've got a little uh, special yeah. you might be interested in. Wouldn't you like to pay me? I mean, mean, yeah, yeah. Hello, Mr. Bezos. I hear you're more moral than Netflix. Holy shit, yeah. I, I take your point. I take your point. He's in space. He, I've tapped out of this moral quandary, okay? I mean, I keep saying it, but it's very hard to know what progress looks like during late-stage capitalism. I don't know what I'm wanting or hoping for sometimes with feminism. I'm like, well, if I get platformed by Jeffrey Bezos, what? Hold on a minute. Um, 
Anyway, have you got another I'm a feminist but for, for uh, Yes, for good I'm people? a feminist but... Oh, I don't know, have I? Well, look, I'm... A, look, no, I don't want this thing. attitude... This, no, this half-baked attitude. No, pretend it, 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 uh, pretend this is a Netflix special. I'm absolutely committed to this I'm a feminist but... Not. I don't like using Microsoft Teams. <laughs> How is that not feminist? Because I don't like that my face is really small. And the person I'm talking to, their head is massive. I want my head to be massive, okay? We all know that when we're on Zoom, we look at our own face, okay? Oh, and the other do, thing, do. listen, yeah. don't we? And look, the other thing I'm unhappy about with Microsoft Teams, I don't get the settings. I don't know how to do the soft focus. We've all been on Zoom. We understand the settings. We've soft focused the shit out of it now. When I'm on my... Look, when I'm on Zoom, if I'm having a little chat with someone, I'm just two nostrils. And I think, yes, Brister, you look good, love. And you cannot get that on Microsoft Teams. <laughs> Um, I'm a feminist, but it is possible that in the dressing room, Jen Brister said in the previous recording uh, that we did tonight of a previous episode, so if you're listening at home, yes, sometimes we record two episodes on the one night, it's the magic of podcasding, I might have yes. mocked her top to the point where she felt slightly undermined because she said I said it was Elizabethan when clearly it was a Wardian. <laughs> I pointed out, Edwardian. actually, it's Edwardian. And Deborah, what did you say to me? Uh, I said, it's still historical, Jen. <laughs> you know, it's still the same historical shit. Okay. Oh, I didn't say shit. <laughs> yeah, I would whatever. never say that. You know that I would, you know my turns of phrase. I would never say, point to another woman and say, it's still the same historical shit. You've added the shit. <laughs> I said, it's still an historical costume. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love well, it. I didn't appreciate the costume bit. I love it. Live from King's Place in London, the Spot Today the Shop presents the Guilty Feminists and me, Deborah Francis White, guest co-host Jim Bristol, and our very special guest, Katie Wicks, Sophie Jameson, talking about food. This is the Guilty Feminist, the podcast in which we explore our noble goals as 21st century feminists and the hypocrisies and insecurities which undermine them. I'm Deborah Francis White, with me is Jen Brister, and we're talking about food, glorious food. <laughs> Um, okay, all right, we need to do some stand-up, and then we need to get Katie on the show, uh, because I can't wait any longer for, Ka for Katie vibes. Now, um, so, so uh, just to confirm, I'm just doing stand-up for this show, not for the other show. Um, well, what have you got? <laughs> well, I mean, have, got, you got, have you got a set that could be like a two-part set that's partly about food and partly about the NHS? I mean, like, literally, you said it was about femininity, so I've written, I haven't written anything about food. <laughs> Oh, I, do, I might have said that, actually. I don't know why I said that. I think I was thinking... So I've got broadly. absolutely fuck all about food. <laughs> OK, no one cares. This is what I've just decided with the stand-up. If I say, would you like to hear some stand-up from Jen Brister, whatever you say, they're not sitting there going, this is not linked to the theme. I used to, like, make everyone do it to the theme, and everyone was like, oh, for fuck's sake, another one of Deborah's gigs where I have to write unique stand-up. I go, no, just wedge it into something you've got. I've decided <laughs> nobody gives a fuck. This is so... As long as you're funny, no one gives a fuck. Uh, would you like to see some Jen Brister do some stand-up comedy? <laughs> The police on stage, the incredible Jen Bristol! Isn't it lovely? <laughs> Sorry, I, I, I haven't done a live, uh, it's been ages since I've done a live uh, Guilty Feminist um, uh, show. I, how is everyone? Is everyone, are you all all right? Good, because it's it's just so lovely to be out, but also to be in. And you know, I, I mean, people uh, it's, haven't done. You know, it hasn't been that long since we started doing stand up comedy again. And you know, when I started to do stand up comedy inside, friends of mine would say to me, "How does that feel, Jen? You must be buzzing doing stand up comedy in front of a real life audience when you've been doing stand up comedy online, and now you get to go outside and make a connection with people, and you can get out there and make them laugh. What that must feel like for you to feel that incredible energy from an audience, you there in front of them, making them laugh, and them sitting there just enjoying you. You must be enjoying every single moment of this gym because you haven't been able to do it 18 months without having a real life audience in front of you. There you are, standing in front of people, thinking, Wow, this is me. This is me, a stand up comedian. For a while, you didn't even feel like a stand up comedian, did you, Jim? Because you weren't doing stand up comedy. How can you be a 
stand up comedian if you're not even doing stand up well doing it on zoom it's not doesn't make sense but now look at you here outside doing stand up comedy creating creating an energy creating a connection doing what you do best as a stand up comedian how does it feel have you enjoyed it is this are you is this are you is it no i actually feel nothing um <laughs> look if i'm honest i miss zoom gigs okay i I do, I miss them. Listen, don't be, look, I had to go to Aberystwyth a couple of weeks ago. No offence to anyone that's from Aberystwyth, but once I got there, I thought, fuck it, I live in Aberystwyth. It took me seven and a half hours. Do you think I want to travel? For, I'm 46. Do you think I want to travel for seven and a half hours? Do you know, I, for like three days or four days before that gig happened, I was looking at my NHS app going, fuck, ping, you bastard. Will you fucking ping? But nothing. I had to go to Aberystwyth. <laughs> oh, who doesn't love a Zoom gig? Just go up to your bedroom, open up your laptop, dip, 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 close it downstairs. Boom! You've made eleven pounds. Thank you. <laughs> I miss those heady, heady days. Oh, yeah. I, I don't know how. I don't know how you. Did you? Are you, are you all all right? Did you cope all right during lockdown? There was a lot of chit chat, wasn't there, as about you know. Oh, you know, let's be motivated. Let's just bloody well all gather together and let's just, let's not be depressed. Let's just do yoga with Adrienne and make, <laughs> and make sourdough. <laughs> I'm not going to lie to you, I gave up hour one. Um, crawled into a pair of tracksuit bottoms and just wanked myself to death. Um, <laughs> I haven't got those tracksuit bottoms anymore. Are they, uh... It's very difficult to explain uh, that whole. Anyway, I. Um, <laughs> I, I tell you what I miss about lockdown is an elastic waist. I, as women, what are we doing? Not wearing an elastic waist all the. I mean, I could have fit another person in these bloody trousers. These, I mean, I, these tractor bombs, I loved them so much because they were, they were gave, gave me security with elastic around the waist, you know? I was like, oh, God, that's so comfortable. I see where else I like them. Elastic around the ankles. Oh, God, the confidence I felt in those. Because I'm not going to lie to you, I went feral very quickly during lockdown. Very quickly went feral. And there were days where I was like, this is bleak. I'm, never, I'm not going to get through this. And I thought, you know what? If I shit myself, at least it will catch it. And that's where I got to in lockdown. And I didn't appreciate being told to just bloody well, just get on with it um, I mean I'm a feminist but um, Gwyneth Paltrow needs to fuck off now okay? <laughs> um, I don't want to hear from it. just you know it's, this is a time for reading this is a, did she, she put up an Instagram post like seconds after lockdown happened like she was planning it like, oh my God, this is perfect for this Instagram moment. Should we just reading or pick up a, a language or learn a musical instrument? I'm like, love, I am stuck in the house with two children who do not respect me. I have all the authority of Matt Hancock at a SAGE meeting, so forgive me if I don't have time for your no makeup makeup routine and your fucking vagina candle, okay? So why don't you shove them up, you gluten-free chuff love, all right? Anyway, she's blocked me now. But um, <laughs> I, I don't know if you, have you been on Goop? Have you been on her web? This is what, what I, what I resent is being told um, what, as a woman, I need. Okay, I resent that. Don't tell me what I need as a woman. I know what I need as a woman, okay? And it's none of the shit that you're trying to sell me. Who here, who here has been on Goop? I want to. I want to hear from you. What is it? What What is it you get? What is it you get? Hello. What is it? That What is it you get from that website? I'd love to know. I was just intrigued. You're intrigued. Did you buy anything? I was going to get one of those vagina stoves as a joke. You were going to get a vagina. S Did you say stove? <laughs> Has it gone up from a candle that now you can cook? <laughs> But now it's a stove, but it's in the shape of my vulva. Okay, let's go. Is that what is a vagina stove? Stone. I'm not oh, stone. Thank fuck for that. <laughs> Can you imagine and bake your own sourdough? And... <laughs> the thing is, you know, they say privilege dilutes empathy. Well, it bloody well does, doesn't it? And I think Gwyneth Paltrow is a perfect example of that with all of her fucking stupid shit you can get on Goop. Um, like, 
okay, or I want to talk about the useless crap that's aimed exclusively at women, of course, on Goop, okay. Um, there's, there was an article when I went on, and it really intrigued me, and it was titled, or entitled rather, um, How to Get a Just Had an Orgasm Glow. <laughs> <laughs> Girls, are you interested? <laughs> now, immediately, I was angry. I was angry reading that. How to how to get a just had how to get a just had an orgasm glow. Okay, here's what you need to do. You can buy some a glycolic acid overnight glow peel, forty pounds. Some Goop Glow Microderm Instant Glow Exfoliator, forty pounds. Vitamin C and Hyaluronic Acid Glow Serum, (laughs) £125. Hyaluronic Serum, £300. Gold Sculpting Bar, a gold sculpting bar. This is just a piece of metal. I don't know what the fuck you do with this, but you sculpt your face with it. £195. Goop, fucking... Goop Jeans Eye Cream, £55. And this is great. I mean, this... Invisi Foaming Tan Water, £30. Fortifying Hair Serum, £70. That comes to about £800 to get the Just Had an Orgasm Glow. All, ladies, (laughs) you could do what I do. And have a wank. Now, you don't need the tracksuit bottoms, but I guarantee you, you will come and you will get that. I just had an orgasm after wow. So, fuck you, Gwyneth. <laughs> Jen Brister, everybody! It's now time to have a little bit of the old Deborah Frost's weight. So I've done a bit of strange therapy. It's a bit offbeat, this therapy. Um, I won't tell you what it is uh, because some of you will judge me. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'm going to tell you, if you come to my stand-up show, I'm doing a live stand-up show that will not be recorded, will not be on the internet. I, I'm going to tell you stuff at the stand-up show I don't want online. Uh, I don't want my mother to be able to hear it. I don't want some law enforcement officials to be able to hear it. (laughs) Just come if you'd like to hear it. If I bring it to a place near you, lovely. If I don't, there's nothing I can do. Um, So I won't tell you what the therapy was, because I can't, because it might have been a little bit illegal, but it was 100% therapeutic. Now... um, Some of you might remember me in a previous episode talking about how um, I discovered that a lot of doctored children comfort eat. And uh, one of the reasons is if your lizard brain is always in fight or flight, which if you the first thing that happened ever when you were born was that you were relinquished, you get some cortisol to the brain and you're in trauma mode and you're in fight or flight from breath one if you're not put into your mother's arms and you're just taken away and then you're just looked after by a series of nurses for 10 days until your birth parents turn up. I mean, that's quite specific to me. Um, <laughs> but the reason you comfort eat, I thought it was because you weren't getting enough like milk in the hospital because you just like fed on a rota. But apparently, it's also partly that your lizard brain, which is in fight or flight, is comforted by food because, does anyone remember the rule? Uh, Your lizard brain is calmed by grazing because if you're having a snack, you're not under attack. That's that's my rhyme, but I think it's a good mnemonic. Um, So that's why if if you're prone to comfort eating, you're thinking, why am I still eating? I'm not hungry. I don't want this. I don't even like it. What am I eating this for? Oh, my God, I'm still having having another biscuit. I don't even like these biscuits. Why am I having another biscuit? Oh, I've eaten the whole packet now. Now I feel sick. If you do that, I mean, I, I can't be the only one to do that. I refuse to believe. You're lying to me. You're lying to me. If Do you do that ever? Have you ever done that? Thank you. Have you? Just cheer if you've never done that. Okay, there we are. It's not just adopted people then, is it? Unless this audience is all adopted. Just give me a cheer if you're adopted. Okay. Um, so, what of this therapy? It was the sort of therapy where you are getting in touch with a part of your body. Oh, oh, look... Do not put this out on the podcast, Tom. 
So, can someone sing a Britney song underneath it so that we... we <laughs> that's what the police do now. They play, sing a, they play a Britney song so that they, if they're, they're being recorded by someone, then YouTube will take it down. It's true. I've seen it happen. Um, so, if you could just sing Hit Me Baby one more time, which actually is poignant. Um, <laughs> Okay, uh, <laughs> I wouldn't. Okay, so I can't tell you what the treatment was, but the point is, the next day I was in a cafe, I ordered some fries, and I was eating them, and then I got to a point where I didn't want any more, but I was still eating them. I was like, why am I doing this? And I swear, the day after I had this revolutionary therapy, I heard my baby, my inner baby inside of me, this is true, and the inner baby inside said, no, I need to eat, I need to be comforted. And I was like, oh, okay, then, if you need comfort, that's fine, you can have the fries. That truly <laughs> happened to me. So I decided, I decided, because of this, that um, because of our guest tonight, that I should revisit the, one of the very first challenges I ever did on The Guilty Feminist. So five years ago, when I started The Guilty Feminist, I did a challenge, and it was uh, around cake. Because for me, as a woman, my, through my life, cake it has been a private pleasure. I wouldn't, like, order cake without apologising to the waiter, if you see what I mean. I wouldn't go, oh, I'll have the cake, please. Uh, I'll have you got a, got a big piece of chocolate cake. Lovely. Mm, yum. Good for me. I wouldn't say that. What I would always, in my life, before I did this challenge, I would have said is, uh, I'll have just have a cup of tea. I won't have any. Oh. That cake looks good. I shouldn't. I shouldn't. I shouldn't. If I was with someone else, I'd go, do you want to split a piece of cake? Do you want to share a piece of cake? Should we share a piece of cake? Should we share a piece of cake? I mean, I shouldn't, I shouldn't, shouldn't have a piece of cake. No, we don't really need it. 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 And make the waiter talk me into it. Oh, it's really good. It's really good. You should have a piece of cake. Is it good? Is it really good? I mean, if it's really good, we probably should have, we should have a little piece of cake. Should we have a little bit? I, I'll just have a couple of mouthfuls, but you bring me the whole piece. Because, you know, you've got to, yeah. Um, and I wanted to get over that. So the challenge I did those years ago, just give me a cheer if you remember this challenge. Okay, not everyone remembers it. All right, go back and listen. It was good. I went into Patisserie Valerie and I ordered three pieces of cake and a hot chocolate. And I had to do it without apology. I had to say, oh, I'd like the cheesecake, please, and the apple pie, please, and a piece of the Black Forest Gatto. And uh, yeah, I have a hot chocolate. Actually, can you pop some cream on the hot chocolate? <laughs> do you have some ice cream on the side? And I had to do it all without apology. And I learned a lot about myself and also about how women order from the response of the waitress. So I decided to recreate this challenge today. And I needed to order three different kinds of cake without apology or explanation and without the I shouldn't dance. Um, just give me a cheer if you recognize the I shouldn't dance. Now, what this waitress in Patisserie Valerie told me five years ago was every single woman nearly does this, I shouldn't dance. And I'm like, but it's Patisserie Valerie. No one's going in there without the full intention of cake. I would understand if it was a restaurant, you know, we'd go, oh, well, we've had the salmon and we've had the salad and we probably should, oh, we, you know, all that kind of ridiculous language. But it's fucking Patisserie Valerie. It's not an accidental caking. It only sells cake. That is the only reason to be. She was like, yeah, but women do it all the time. Men just come in and go, I'll have a big piece of cake. And I said, do they ever order, like, more than one piece of cake? And she said, yeah. Oh, yeah, it's quite common. I said, do women? She said, no, once a Chinese lady did, and we all talked about it in the kitchen. <laughs> When I ordered, the Patisserie Valerie lady said, when I ordered all of that, she went, everything for you. She was very pleased. Um, I will never forget it. She was from Hungary, which I thought was amusingly <laughs> ironic. Um, anyway, so today I go to my local cafe. It's just the brunch place at the end of my street. I order lunch, and then I ask to see the dessert menu at the same time. So I put my order in, but I go, can I see the dessert menu now? And the waitress smiles at my anticipation. I think, no, I'm getting ahead of the game. But I, as soon as she smiles, I realise I've made a tactical error. I've gone to my local cafe where they will recognise me. I will go back in again. I'm going to have to go back. If it goes wrong, if this experiment goes wrong, I'm going to have to go back and go, oh, find a new local cafe. And I realise immediately I should have gone somewhere far from my house like the first time I did stand-up comedy. But here I am. Um, I've got no time to go somewhere else. The show's tonight. I've got to do it today. So I decide to order the chocolate donuts with caramel sauce, the brownie with ice cream, and a chocolate milkshake. Now, some people are like, oh, is that, is that a too much noise, or I want that noise? There was a series of small orgasmic noises, <laughs> some, I think, of excitement and some of, of revulsion. 
Listen, your emotions are not my problem at this point. I'm sitting in the cafe. I worry slightly because I've, I just read in Katie Wicks's book, uh, Delicacy, that a man in Swansea died from eating too many fairy cakes. I decide I've not ordered any fairy cakes, so I'll be fine. <laughs> now, a handsome male waiter walks by. This is a panic for me because my original waitress was a smiley young woman. And when I see this handsome young male waiter, I think, what if he is the one who's going to take my dessert order? And you know what goes through my mind? Genuinely, I might just order two things if it's him. <laughs> That's what goes through my mind. Unfit. That's my conscious and my unconscious, like, having a chat to each other. Um, it's just not a voluntary thought for those who are judging me. I just think maybe just the chocolate milkshake and the brownie or something like that. Maybe just don't. And then I think, Why? What does it matter if he looks at my body and decides it's not worthy of so much cake? I'm sticking to my guns and hoping it's not him. <laughs> a different handsome man walks by, who's also a waiter, who I think is gay. Um, he comes by with a plate of eggs for someone. He'd be better, I think, than the straight man. Why? Would, why? And then also, would he? Maybe he's got that stereotypically hot gay abs thing going on and will judge me more than his hypothetically straight counterpart. <laughs> Why am I making assumptions about these men's sexualities and judgment of my thighs and cake order? They won't care or notice how ridiculous I am being. They're not going to give a fuck. These young men have lives and lovers and phones to be looking at. They don't care. The waitress comes over, my original waitress. I look her in the eye, relieved, and hold my head still, and I say, I'll have the donuts with the dipping sauce, the chocolate brownie with ice cream, and the chocolate milkshake, please. She laughs and says, yes, you can. <laughs> I know that she cannot let this go further uncommented on, and I am right. She adds, so much chocolate sounds like heaven to me today. I have made her happy just with my reckless ordering and my lack of apology. I watch her walk over to the register, I watch her put the order in, and then I see her on the other side of the cafe telling the other waiters something. <laughs> They're all laughing at something. There's gossip running around. It's me. They're laughing at me and all the cake I've ordered. They're judging me, horrified and fascinated by my gluttony. Either that or I'm paranoid. No, I'm not, because one of them looks over at me. And I make eye contact. Maybe I'm paranoid. Maybe they're talking about me. Maybe both. That's probably most likely. No, they don't care about me at all. They're probably laughing about fun, young, attractive waiter things. <laughs> jokes about the waiter jokes that they have. They've not. They don't give a fuck about me. My cake is not the center of their universe. The handsome man, I assess to be straight, brings over my order when it's ready. He names everything as he puts it down. His eyes are wide. He's enjoying it. Is he mocking me or enjoying me? I open my mouth to lie. It's my birthday or I'm doing a challenge. <laughs> but I close it again because that's not in the rules. The point is I have to be cool with it. I take a spoonful of brownie and eat it in front of his face. Mmm, <laughs> delicious. I eat a little of each and my inner baby says it does not want any more. Of course it does. I'm allowing it everything, so it doesn't want much. The little bastard. Why, why don't I do this every week? This is like turning my relationship with food on and off again. And recalibrating. The handsome waiter walks by again, and he smiles at me indulgently as if I am a toddler he has just delivered ice cream to, who has got it all over her face. I don't have it all over my face. I check, I check. <laughs> a different waitress comes to give me my bill. Not the original one. I ask her what I had asked my original waitress five years ago. I ask her if it's usual for a woman to order so many different desserts. She beams. No, we were all talking about you. <laughs> she genuinely says that. We couldn't believe it. We all wanted to bring it over to you. <laughs> so the handsome straight man won. <laughs> I take that as a win. <laughs> I ask, do women order more than one cake very often? It has never happened, <laughs> she answers. Men, only sometimes. But we all love cake. 
You made us all very happy. Thank you very much. Hello, gang. I'm doing two work in progress shows this Saturday at Camden Comedy Club at 1 p.m. That's Saturday, the 27th of November, and this Sunday, 28th of November at 3 p.m. And this is for my stand up comedy show that's going on at the Soho Theatre the following week. So you have two opportunities to see it and, in fact, help shape it with your laughter or lack of at certain lines. Um, so please come and help me do that. Tickets are five pounds. There are very, very few seats, just like ones dotted around. Uh, for the Soho run, you can check out and buy um, if you still want to get tickets. And there will be tickets released closer to the time and on the day. There's some uh, tickets that this is holding back. So if you've missed out, try closer to the date or on the day. But I do hope that you can come to the Camden Comedy Club. You can get tickets at the Camden Comedy Club's website or just go to guiltyfeminist.com. Um, it's only a fiver and it'll be a fun lunchtime matinee situation. Please join me. I'd really love you to see it. Hello, Guilty Feminists. It's Jessica Regan here, and I am delighted to be announcing our Big Speeches Winter Workshops. They are taking place on Saturday, November 27th, Sunday, November 28th, Saturday, December 11th, Sunday, December 12th, Saturday, January 15th, and Sunday, January 16th. All Saturday workshops are taking place from 10.30am to 2.30pm and all Sunday workshops are taking place from 3 to 7pm. So hopefully whatever part of the world you're in, there's a time slot there that suits you. We are keeping the workshops online as that makes them as accessible and inclusive as possible and we're all about that at The Guilty Feminist. So please go to guiltyfeminist.com forward slash big speeches to secure your place or indeed this could be a Christmas present for someone that you think might need a confidence boost. New year, new you, whatever your motivations, we will be delighted to see you there. Places do book out fast, so act now to avoid disappointment. And of course, as always, there are heavily subsidised places available. Our guest today is a Welsh actor, author and comedian, best known for her roles in Stath, Let's Flats, Ghosts, Ladhood and Taskmaster. Her memoir, Delicacy, which is a phenomenal book, is out now. Please welcome the incredible Katie Wick! <laughs> Katie Wicks, come take a seat. You. My leg went dead. I was really nervous about getting up. Were you? <laughs> yeah. Your book is so good, Katie. Thank you. Thank you very much. I really, really love it. Um, would you read a little of it so this audience can get a sense of I'd, how beautiful it is? I'd love to. I'll try and put it into context. One of the chapters is a recreation of a series of real emails I had with a personal trainer when I first moved to London because I sort of thought they're not going to let me on TV unless I change my entire body. I was wrong, thankfully. So I decided to get these personal training sessions and I was sort of late every time. It was miles across London. She could only see me at like six in the morning. It was hell. And I instantly regretted doing it and um, I couldn't afford it. So I had to just make up this lie that I was an alcoholic to get out of the sessions. <laughs> had and to. Had to was a reach, Katie. <laughs> alcohol's no joke. But it's like, it's the only thing I could think of. I didn't have the emotional maturity to say, this is a huge mistake and I can't afford this. She kept saying, you signed up for 10 sessions. <laughs> and so I just sent this email saying, oh, I'm really sorry, I'm not well. And I've got to cut down on my drinking first. And she sent one back. I actually didn't look at the reply. I was so embarrassed for like months. And then when I finally read it, it was like really, really nice, but I still had to pay. Um, <clears throat> So this is from <laughs> this section. The problem with exercise is that you have to keep doing it. It's not a one-time thing, like chicken pox or drowning. <laughs> Somewhere, I absorbed this notion that optimists were uninteresting and that people who exercised were humorless. I'm not sure when my prejudice began. I don't even buy tampons if they have sporty packaging. <laughs> Maybe I'm just jealous. It wasn't until I stumbled across the concept of sadness as an act of resistance that I had an understanding of why I hadn't wanted my suffering to be jogged out of me. The unhappiness was perhaps trying to tell me something. 
it was useful. And it was only when I found out that Alanis Morissette did triathlons that I started to wonder if I'd been the one in the wrong all along when it came to exercise. <laughs> As an undergraduate, I had made friends with women who were brilliant and powerful, passionately intelligent and funny. They seemed rebellious and impossibly glamorous with their menthol cigarettes, asymmetrical haircuts and book recommendations. And yet, I recall how it was the men who mainly spoke in lectures. The women were all quiet at first, whilst the men spoke freely, like a mid to late noughties panel show. <laughs> we were still trying to understand our power. I'll leave it there. Thank you. That's a particularly glorious chapter in which Katie uh, recounts the emails between her and her personal trainer but the, the twist is, everything underlined wasn't true. So it was sent, but wasn't true. So something like, um, I really enjoyed the personal training session today, was underlined. <laughs> and anything in italics was something that was true, but she didn't send. So it was the bit of the email that went, I hated it. And, uh, <laughs> and I, I wish you were dead. Neither of those, those are not real quotes. They're not real quotes. I should but, have said that, you're right. That's the bit I, that was there, but didn't actually, was, was thinking, uh, but... But it's so, such a clever book like that because I, I just, once you're into that rhythm, just one word, like good, is underlined in a sentence and it's just glorious. Um, it's very moving uh, because it's also about death and grieving. I don't and, die, spoiler alert. <laughs> no, Kate doesn't die once. Um, but it's so relatable while being very poetical. There's a piece of cake on the front uh, it's very cake-based. Every chapter is titled after a cake, like Anxiety Cake, or um, let me look at some of the other chapter headings. It's a memoir about cake and death. So Jam Roly-Poly, or Jenny nearly died in a car accident because her boyfriend was older and drove too fast, or Lemon Drizzle for Victims, um, or uh, Three-Tiered Bun Cake, or Idea for a Sitcom. Um, and so that will just those title, chapter titles will give you an idea of how poetical it is. If you have, in any way, a difficult relationship with food or have had a difficult relationship with food, um, you will really, really, really relate to this book. And, Katie, what really came across to me is how much there was this sort of triangulation between food, the body, the image, the industry that you're in, the, the idea of what an actor must look like, but also your relationship, I think, almost back to the being fed in the womb and your mother and how all of those things are interconnected. Yeah. <laughs> that stuff you said about um, feeling you're in a baby and the, the thing about adoption, I, I found that so profound because, well, for several reasons. I guess, first of all, like because my way out of healing from like years and years of like a very kind of bulimic way of eating that was really destructive was intuitive eating, which isn't for everyone, but it really helped me. And a lot of it is sort of feeding your inner child kind of thing. Mm. So it reminded me of that. But also, the way I structured it was, um, which reminded me of what you were talking about, I think that first moment of sort of disconnection from yourself or trauma, I had to sort of find something to kind of... Food was the answer. Worrying about food, worrying about my body, I thought that was the answer. So how I structured it was, you know, there's an initial trauma, and then I think, oh, I need to distract myself and not feel all this... For some people, it's, you know, alcohol, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. For me, it was, I'm just going to, you know, be obsessed with food, eating, not eating my body, as my mother was and her mother was and so on. And then it kind of works for a bit until it doesn't, and then you sort of hit rock bottom, and then you're forced to heal. So that's kind of how I structured, um, yeah, my relationship with, with food in the book. I mean, I, I haven't read your book, Katie. I, want, I, I will read it because I already feel like there's stuff in there that I think I can definitely relate to. And I, I wonder, if, it's kind of weird. I don't, do we know any women, really, that don't have a difficult relationship with food at, or at some point in their life haven't had a yeah. difficult relationship with food? Because, you know, the second we feel any kind of uh, self-loathing or any kind of thing that we're not, we don't quite match whatever the beauty is of that moment... I don't know about anyone else, but I've got to eat a fucking pie or have, like, a, a litre of ice cream to feel better yeah, about myself. it's so normalised as, yeah, how, how we cope. It was almost like um, a biography of my, my body. I feel like it was almost, you know, like, constructed for me, all these messages 
I got about it. I absorbed like every cell of my body absorbed that message. If it wasn't this bit wasn't right, this bit was okay, this bit needed work, you know, that I was tall, like all these messages just stayed with me throughout my life. And I feel like the process of healing is kind of, you know, I've had to sort of reconstruct it on my own terms, sort of self-defining what I like about it and what I should feed it and not feed it. So yeah, but it's it's terrifying how normal it is. The thing with food is with something like if you want to stop smoking I talked to my hypnotherapist about this um, and she said it's much easier to get someone to stop smoking or stop drinking than to speak to their unconscious and get them to cut back she said if someone wants to just stop drinking that's not that difficult for a hypnotherapist to help you do for many people I'm sure that's not true for everyone but if somebody wants to not drink a lot and just drink one glass of red wine a night, she said that's very, very difficult. And the thing with food is we all need it. And with something that's, I think a lot of things that are, if alcohol is not good for you and you will know that, then you can just go, I don't have a great relationship with alcohol. I'm dumping it like a bad boyfriend. But with food, you can't because it is the thing that nourishes you. It is the thing that you need. And so if you are in an abusive relationship with food, how yeah. can you get out? And if you're recovering from eat, an eating disorder or disordered eating and you walk down the street and you see like an ad up for a diet pill, it would be like, I imagine having a problem with alcohol and seeing someone say, have a drink, you know, like every step. So it is everywhere. Mm-hmm. And and diet industry advertising to us. So I agree. And I... This is a horrible name drop, but I had like this oh my, incredible honor to meet Susie Albert when I, as part of the promotion oh. for this. Fat is a feminist issue if anyone's young. Which also changed my life, that book. And I said to her, like, I feel about 80% on a good day recovered from all of this. And it's been 10 years, I'd say, since I've, you know, really had a really bad time. And um, I said, do you think that's like a realistic ambition to have? And she agree that that's probably the best it's going to get with the constant what, 80%? provocations. Yeah, yeah. But, but you have an 80% decent relationship with food. Yeah. yeah. Well, that makes me feel a bit better because yeah. my relationship with food is definitely better than it was. Yeah. And, and that's come from the, the goddess. Of, yeah, I made a radio show with her once years really? and years ago. Yeah, but it was so long ago, I don't think she'd remember. Um, but then Simon Munnery does a bit about sharing a car with her to a festival and there was a big write-up about her in the Sunday Times or something. And she opened it up and went, oh, I wish they hadn't used that picture of me. I hate that picture. And I was like, oh, wow. it so makes me feel good yeah. to hear that Susie Orbach also looks at pictures of herself and goes, I hate that. I don't know. Because we just don't see us. Yeah. We, it's not possible she to see She can't escape. Yeah. No. I, I think 80%. I feel... I, the other day, like When I came to do this challenge again, I'm definitely better than I was. Like It was a more familiar thing to do. But I did think all of these weird things that ran through my head, like, oh, I hope it's not the handsome man that comes over. What the fuck? Like, am I going to lay this guy? Is that what I think? <laughs> but it's not about that. It's just like... And also, what, why wouldn't he want to have sex with me? I'm amazing. And I probably seem, yeah. I probably seem fun, like someone who's come over three puppies if I order three pieces of cake. <laughs> I probably seem really fun to that guy. It's probably why he asked to bring the cake over. But he did put everything down and went, that's the brownie, yeah. that's the donuts. <laughs> And a chocolate milkshake for you. And, and also, it is, it's unusual to see... Basically, as a society, we don't like to see women enjoying themselves at all. And we don't like to see women being taking control of, of any aspect of their life. It's threatening to people. And, you know, you going into a, into a shop, and uh, into a patisserie and saying, I'm going to have three cakes, I'm going to bloody enjoy them, and uh, you're going to just, uh, no one's going to, co- I'm not going to comment it, I'm not going to apologise for it, I'm just going to yeah. sit here in front of you, and I'm going to enjoy it. <laughs> that in itself it's so is, a, is, is shocking. It's, yeah, it's, it's shocking. It's when such I, a strange, I, um, that, that's so strange, that's a yeah, rebellious act though. But that would be so radical. I feel like I grew up with men's food and women's food, and that's how it was and that the men eat, could eat what they wanted, and the women just ate Rivita mm-hmm. and the diet version of whatever the men were eating. <clears throat> and I guess the idea with, like, one of the sort of central tenets of intuitive eating is that you, you kind of get to know the foods that were kind of banned from your childhood that you're so obsessed with because they're so out of reach. So, like, that's exactly <laughs> one of the exercises that all would probably recommend is, like, just surrounding yourself with cake and knowing no one's going to take it away and you're an adult now and you can decide how you feed yourself and it's there's nothing it's not bad 
there's no good or bad foods. It's that kind of idea. Or naughty foods. Yeah, naughty. Naughty. all that oh, sheep naughty. language and stuff like that. But I want, I do sort of want to, I kind of think, I probably sometimes have been guilty on this podcast of saying the feminist thing that I should say and not wanting to trigger anybody and all of that sort of stuff. And today, when I went through that, and I knew, you know, also I was recording every single little minor thought I had because I knew I needed to make a comedy set out of it, right? So I was, of course, just noting to myself what came into my head and anything I thought, like, he's handsome, I hope he doesn't bring it over, I wrote it down because that's where you get the comedy from is the truth inside of you. Things you wouldn't normally admit. But I did think, I'm a bit disappointed I'm not a bit further along. And when will this not be an issue for me? And I just sort of went, oh, is this luggage I never get to put down? I'm going to carry this luggage my whole life. And I'm never really going to put it down. Because my relationship with food is always going to be a bit fucked. And I'd love to put it down. I'd love to put it yeah. down. And I did think, you could just put it down. You could do that. <laughs> yeah. You could just come in here every day and order three cakes. And the thing is, when you let yourself, and it's a challenge, you then can't eat it. Like, you can only eat a bit, the, the normal amount that your body would want. Of Oh, that's delicious. Yeah. Oh, that's lovely. Or, and I, 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 weirdly, my hand pushed it away. And I was like, what are you doing, hand? Bring it back. Bring it back. It didn't want it because it was allowed yeah. it. And this is so fun. Yeah, and also I had no idea what my real appetite was because it was also fucked up of like under eating, overeating, and so I had to sort of get to know what that was again. And it, it took it just took months and months of like trying to trying to Figure listen. If I, yeah, and because I I feel like I, there was such a message of me having no kind of ownership over my body from such a young age. I think I was fat shamed at about seven. And I remember the moment of like, oh, right, life's changed. There's something wrong with my body now. I'm always going to have to like work on this thing like it's a project for the rest of my life. And yeah, it was like a feeling of I had no, I couldn't advocate for my own body in the world almost. And also I think being put on diets at a young age, it's so like you're so alienated from yourself and, you know, you're such a so objectified that yeah like I it's like I didn't know how to feed myself and I'm still learning how to cook because my mum didn't cook my dad didn't cook and I just was like I don't I won't want to cook because I'll just eat it all mm. which is so horribly masochistic and sad to say but um yeah like in lockdown I sort of learned to cook properly <laughs> like yeah. like I'm so I'm even at this age I feel like I'm so behind on the self-care when it comes to food because yeah What do we love about food? Because I feel like as feminists, when we come to food, we're often going, oh, like we're like, can we just talk? Can we just for a second talk about licking the spoon in the cake bowl? And like, (laughs) okay, I'm going to admit something. One reason I found it a bit of a struggle today, I I didn't put this in the thing because I wanted it to be funny. But one reason I found a bit, (laughs) this might be funny. I don't know. It's embarrassing. But one, one reason I found it a bit of a struggle to go in and have cake today is I didn't really want it because last night... And normally I'd be delighted to have an opportunity to go in and just order three cakes. But I I have that opportunity a lot. I just don't give it to myself. But last night, I just stayed really late writing. And there was some cookie dough um, that someone had given me. It was some kind of in a hamper or something. And I put it in the freezer thinking, well, we're never going to use that. Like maybe at one point we'll have kids over and I'll think we would chop it up and make cookies. But then I remembered Americans just buy it to eat. Yeah. And I needed to stay up to four in the morning writing. And I thought, oh, if I had some of that cookie dough, it would be sugar and it would keep me awake. But then, so I just chopped off a bit and then went and sat down and write it. And then I thought, oh, I'll just have a bit more. And then I did the fatal thing of going over and bringing it with me. Yeah. And then I was like scooping it out with a teaspoon, frozen cookie dough <laughs> out of a sausage. It was like in a sausage. And then I noticed that in the freezer, Tom Selinski, my husband slash producer this podcast, had bought some haagen for no fucking reason. <laughs> I don't know why he bought haagen I don't think... Why did you buy haagen Tom? Uh, because if I spent £4 more on delivery, I got free delivery. <laughs> Thank you. Isn't delivery, delivery three free pounds? Delivery. Isn't delivery three pounds, Tom? <laughs> OK. And, Anyway, sure. so sure. we thought, I'll get ice cream rather than pay for nothing. So then there's ice cream in there, so I thought, ooh... After a couple of hours, more hours writing, I then went. I, did, I had like a quarter of a container of Haagen Dazs, and then went to bed feeling a bit like, "What have you just done? You've eaten the equivalent of a whole meal, <laughs> but in sugar, like a child yeah, now feeling a yeah. bit sick." 
Um, I don't really, really know why I'm telling you this now, but it's just sort of part of the... It's a confessional yeah. Oh, yeah. moment. How delicious. That's right. We're talk, yeah. meant to be talking about good things. And I've veered off into something negative again. But like just being able to kind of... At first, when I was eating that cookie dough, it was like the feel of licking the bowl because it's yeah. uncooked. Yes. And just sort of reveling sometimes in how good food is mm. and how when we just let ourselves eat it without judgment, which is... I want to say it happens to me more, but I eat nutritious food without judgment. But when it's something that's stepping over into you're only eating this for pleasure, I think that's what it is. Yeah. I think I'm figuring out now. If I'm only eating for pleasure and not for sustenance and nutrition, yeah. I'm automatically in this stop it now, stop it now, stop it now, stop it, can't stop it, can't stop it, stop it now, stop it now, can't stop it, you're still <laughs> eating it, stop it. Why are you still eating it? And that's the bit I'd like to break. I'd like to go, you're going to eat some hagen now, you're really going to enjoy it. Eat that and enjoy it. You're right, there's almost something deviant about eating raw food. <laughs> Naughty. Yeah, it's funny. God, it kind of makes me think loads of things. I mean, like, <clears throat> it's so funny. I feel like I really struggle to write about joy, and I don't know what that's about, because you're so right. I was doing a book festival, and they sort of paired me with someone who writes about food in, in, in such a, like, luxurious way, and I was a bit like, I can't, I'm not writing about it in that way. But in general, I think I find writing about joy less interesting and there's less to write about, and it's less complex. But also, like, it's oddly... Sort of those moments feel more private, like, oh, yeah. I want to keep those to myself. But what you're describing also, just as you were saying, it made me think it's so much anxiety as well, isn't it? Like, that constant checking yourself, and it's the control, I think. And also, it's sort of like a self-harm, isn't it? It's that yeah. constantly punishing yourself for just enjoying something that you're allowed to enjoy because food, like you, like Deborah said, we can't. You, you can live without booze, you can live without drugs, but you cannot live without food. And, you know, I had a very different sort of upbringing because my mum did nothing but cook, you know, and, and she's a feeder and was very, very anti-diets and very, very anti-me looking at my body or, or my weight or whatever. And so I think even though I did go through, like in my late teens and early 20s, I did definitely go through it with my weight. I managed to sort it out because I just feel like I had a different attitude towards food being about making your body strong. And that's what I feel like we lose, is that you feed yourself to make yourself strong and, and, and rather than it being about... It's a good food, it's a clean food, it's a dirty food. You, do, do you, know, you, know, you know what I mean? And, and I think for young women in particular, we need to change the narrative around what food does. And it's about, you know, it's not, it's, yes, it's about, uh, you know, nourishing yourself. It's also, we should be able to enjoy, have the enjoyment side of it without there being like self flagellation. I mean, I remember Marion Pashley, who's a comedian, she wrote a, a joke years ago about, you know, she went into, a, she went into a, a bakery, a Greg's or whatever, and said, oh, can I have a. Uh, uh, an eclair, and the woman behind the counter went, ooh, that's a bit naughty, isn't it? We're having a chocolate eclair, it's a bit naughty. She went, is it, love? It's only naughty if I smear it on my boyfriend's cock, actually. It's just, <laughs> it's just a cake. And I think that should be our attitude. It's not naughty, it's just a fucking cake. I mean, that's a, it's a motto for life. <laughs> To sing us out, please welcome a British singer-songwriter who began writing songs at the age of nine. Her latest EP releases out now. Please welcome Sophie Jamieson. <laughs> you didn't take any time at all to get to the stage, Sophie. No, no. Normally they take ages. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Thank I'm you for really coming good. and joining us. Thank you so much. I've been, uh, I've been a fan of this podcast from day one, so... This is very special to me. So you remember the first cake challenge? I think I do, actually. I, I uh, yeah, I uh, actually, I work in a restaurant and uh, I'm familiar with those waiters chatting to each other about what people are ordering. Oh, um, really? What do they say? Um, um, <laughs> it varies. I, I work in a steak restaurant and uh, usually it's a matter of um, how big the steak is. But um, usually the, the attitude is have, have whatever you want yeah, and enjoy they, yourself. Yeah, they did seem to take genuine point. joy in it. They weren't seeming to be judging in a, in a... It was definitely news, but it wasn't like... It wasn't like... Mm. It was like, ha. Oh. Um, <laughs> I, I would have loved to have taken all of your cakes over to you if it was, if it was me. Oh, well, Sophie, you can't bring me cake, but you can bring me music. 
So just while you're picking a good guitar up, Katie, was there anything you came to say you didn't get to say? I've mentioned the book, Tick. Paperback's out 27th of January. 27th of January, yeah, paperback. Right. And you can get it now in hardback, and you can Correct. get it in audio, you can get it on Kindle. But whatever you do, get, get it. it. Uh, Stath Let's Flats oh, is yeah. coming out soon. Tomorrow night. Um, so, uh, and it's won some BAFTAs, and you're yeah. in it. Uh, yeah. So uh, it's on Channel 4 at quarter past ten, and but Correct. you can catch up on if you get on all fours. Um, <laughs> Jen Bristow, anything to plug? No. Okay. <laughs> follow Jen wherever you can follow her. Also find Katie on social media. And uh, Sophie, if these people like your song, where can they get it? Um, it's on the internet. It's on the, the usual streaming platforms and, uh, and an EP that I have on vinyl. As well. A new EP that you have on vinyl. Yeah. It's very retro and I love it. Take it away, Sophie Jameson. Thank you. Um, the song is called Space. And um, I didn't actually know what the theme tonight was, but I think maybe it's, it's apt after all, which is handy. There's a space. Waiting for you to fill it Don't miss it Don't kill it Don't I would hate for you to omit it Don't miss it Don't kill it Forgive it to live it. Come fill it. Come. You only have to forgive.
Thank you so much. Sophie Jameson, everybody. You have been listening to The Guilty Feminist with me, Nova Francis, my guest host, Jen Brister, and our very special guest, Katie Wicks, with music from Sophie Jameson. The recording engineer was Chris Sharp. Music was by Mark Hodge. The producer was Tom Salinsky for the Spontaneity Shop. Thanks to Zoe Becker and everyone at King's Place, as well as all of you for listening. For more information about this and other episodes, visit guiltyfeminist.com. I felt the inner baby, the inner... Uh, the inner relinquished ba- infant inside of me. That's actually true. Um, uh, but your mocking laughter doesn't hurt. Um, so, no, you can laugh at anything. It's comedy, so it's fine. It's fine. I don't want you now to be frightened to laugh. I really wish I hadn't said that, because I'd be frightened to laugh. Think, oh, are we mocking her? Are we mocking her sadness? Are we mocking her pain? Yes, please do. I'm a comedian. That's what I live for. Um, <laughs> I live for you to mock my pain and for me to mock Jen's collar. Now... <laughs> Introducing Media Storm from the House of the Guilty Feminist. Hello, hello, hello. Please welcome your permanent hosts, Matilda Mallinson and Helena Moria. Thank you, Deborah. Now, Matilda and Helena, I am delighted to say that you're joining the House of the Guilty Feminist. What an honour. What is Media Storm? We're journalists and this is an investigative journalism podcast, but we are taking a different approach to old stories that crop up time and again in our news. And that is by looking at them through the lens of the people who live those stories, who are the people whose voices you almost never hear. But who are spoken about over and over and over again. If journalists do speak to people with lived experience, their accounts are often thrown in as case studies. And I remember having this mansplained to me once by a white male reporter at one of the whitest papers in the country. He said, Matilda, case studies aren't hard news. And I think that's the problem is that he saw these people as case studies. The people we speak to have more to offer than their experience. They have the expertise that comes with experience. They have informed opinions, often more informed and less agenda driven than the politicians and corporate reps that do get all the airtime. That is the capacity in which we will be speaking to these people on Media Storm. So how did you come up with the idea for Media Storm? There's, there's something called right of reply in journalism, right? It's the most basic principle that is taught to you pretty much as soon as you enter into any kind of journalism degree. Day one. Day one. It's giving people the chance to respond to comments or allegations about them. A lot of journalists seem to forget right of reply when it comes to minority groups. Now, a lot of people will probably say, oh, but the articles I read always have both sides and the TV that I watch always have both sides. But this principle of getting a comment from both sides has been distorted. You can, for example, have a both sides on the mayor of London expanding the ULES charge. So some people will go, yeah, that's really important because we need to clear up London's toxic air. Other people will go, "Mm, I don't know, that puts too high a cost on people who require a car for work or family reasons. That's something you can have a reasoned debate about. Yet some editors and journalists now use the idea of both sides and apply that to fundamental human rights. We're now seeing debates on TV and in papers about whether black people really do face discrimination. We're now seeing debates of this. It's got to the point that like, I wouldn't be surprised if I turned on the TV and there was a debate of somebody saying, yes, we do breathe oxygen in and somebody saying, no, we don't. So when Helena and I were working together, we used to grumble whenever we were feeling frustrated by the style of coverage. I think the peak for me was the summer of 2019 when, quote, channel migrants started trending again. Refugees in boats coming across the channel to Britain. We must have published 30 articles in a fortnight on refugees, not a single one of which featured a single refugee. What that means is our readers are having this extreme form of immigration explained to them 
by people who've never done it. I felt like we weren't giving our readers very good information, maybe. And and we were also failing on the first tenet of journalism. Why is it that this fundamental right of reply seems to have gone out of fashion? What's happened? So look, in a digital age, journalists are immensely time pressured and there are logistical barriers. If a news story isn't practically instantaneous, it's gone. You lost it. Someone else has it. And it's got to get out on 15 different social media platforms, all with their own optimized keywords, hashtags, captions. But that doesn't quite answer the question, because if you look at the groups that journalists do find time to question and those that they don't, the people being missed out are consistently, predictably marginalized groups and also groups that the media often profits off demonizing. And on Tilda's point there, you know, there is such a significant lack of diversity in newsrooms. When media organizations fail to address this lack of diversity and fail to address actually also unconscious bias and and inclusion, the standards of reporting from those newsrooms suffer. They really do. I've been in newsrooms of big organizations where I can count the people of color, myself included, on one hand. I've pitched stories and been told, hmm, that's not really relevant. But really what those mostly male, mostly white editors are saying are, that's not really relevant to me. But if there were more non-white, female, transgender, gay, working class people at the top of these organizations, those stories are going to be relevant. They are going to be talked about and they are going to really help people. And if you see journalism as something that helps people by delivering accurate and and up-to-date information to the masses, then you got to include all the masses, you know? (laughs) So what you're saying is the news that we read on our phones or, or watch on videos, that news is curated. Exactly. So exactly the same way that if you tune into network television, the only dramas that you can watch are the ones that have been commissioned. And so if all the people commissioning dramas are only interested in dramas about posh white people, that's all you get. And then you think, oh, that's all the drama that's available. As we have sought as a society to say, hey, we'd be interested in stories told from other people's points of view. And, we, and we've and we struggled with that. We understand. I think we understand that with drama. But with the news, we think, no, the news is the news. Mm-mm. Turns out the news is not the news. The news is curated just like, say, BBC drama. Yeah. And the reason you think that is because journalists tell you that they're objective. I remember we had this debate on my journalism degree. We had a debate about whether objectivity was a real thing journalists could aspire to. And there was a divide. Half the class said, yes, of course. And half the class said, objectivity is a myth. I wonder if you could tell me what you think the demographic of each half of the class was. Is it possible that the people in the dominant group who normally get a voice in the media thought that objectivity was possible? Yes. And that the people who were not often represented in the media said, no, we think that objectivity is a myth. Mm -hmm. It seemed that the dominant group you described believed that everybody except for them superimposes their minority perspective onto the objective reality of how the world really is. Mm, Interesting. And I'm sure that there's going to be lots of white male middle class listeners who also want this perspective. Nearly all of the men that I know, and certainly all the ones I'm friends with, they're hungry for these kind of stories as well. And they're also hungry to know what they don't know. We've all got unconscious biases. I have, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm I'm a tall white woman who went to Oxford. I've definitely got my blind spots. And so the more that I can be introduced to other forms of media that say, hey, the news isn't the news, the news is curated. Mm -hmm. Somebody decides what's a story and somebody decides what's a Mm non-event. Somebody decides whose voices need to be heard and somebody decides whose voices are too hard to find. Or are you an expert or are you a case study? And even the fact of calling someone who's a refugee a case study implies, well, they're not a person with views, they're somebody so other, their life is an academic study to us. Exactly. Could you tell us some of the topics you might be covering and some of the people you might be speaking to? Yeah, we are going to be looking at irregular immigration, which is just another way of saying illegal immigration without the factually incorrect and loaded overtones. We will be speaking to, and this one comes with a content warning, rape survivors, people who are homeless, people who have suffered discrimination at work due to disabilities. We'll also be looking into how the pandemic was reported on and how that ignited further anti-Asian abuse and hate crimes. 
we'll be looking into how we talk about body image and fat phobia and drugs and the war on drugs. Also joining us in the studio will be people who've been in prison and even prison officers exposing a frankly archaic criminal justice culture. We'll also be looking into trans rights and sex worker rights. So what's the tone of the show? What should people expect when they tune in? We kick off with an investigation. You, the listener, will be with me or Helena or both of us on the road. We'll take you to the scene of the crime, so to speak. You'll meet people with a kaleidoscope of experiences and we will use their insights to answer one big question that we think the media is failing to ask. So that sounds like it's got like a true crime feel to it. When you said the scene of the crime and I'm following you and going with you, I'm really excited to come with you on your journeys to find out what's happening. Well, thank you. Now, given given that when, when we did raise this issue with an editor, the response was, you know, oh, it's so difficult to get access to these groups. You know, it has become so normalized to not even approach some groups for comments that I genuinely don't think journalists notice they're not doing it. So what we wanted was for listeners to feel like they're on that road with us to kind of see the process, to spot the questions that aren't being asked and be equipped with some tools as to how to answer them and who to speak to. Will it all be in the field? So in the second half of the episode, we'll then be able to kind of shake off some of that heaviness of the investigation. And we're going to be back in the studio with some special guests where we'll have a really open and honest and frank discussion about the way that the wider mainstream media reports on that topic. It'll be a bit of a roasting of some of the headlines that have been doing the rounds in in the previous weeks. So the first part of what we're going to get in the investigative journalist van with you and become investigative journalists alongside of you. And in the second part, it's going to be more like a great conversation in the pub, but with somebody who really knows and has lived this topic. Yeah. I'm going to Pop my headphones in and pretend I am an investigative journalist. I, I have some fantasies. I am in a trilby, though. A really, really... With a magnifying glass. I know that's yeah, accurate. beautiful trench coat. I found a clue. <laughs> exactly, exactly. There's a Scooby van in my mind. I don't know. I want to be out there on the trail with you and I'll be able to do that. But I'm also looking forward to spending that conversation with you, learning from someone we wouldn't normally get to hear from. I just can't wait. And I hope all our Guilty Feminist listeners are going to be just as excited as I am by this brand new podcast, Media Storm. One last question. Why is it called Media Storm? Well, if you want to battle through the storm with us and come out to a clearing on the other side, then you'll have to listen. Or more militantly, if you want to storm the media with us, battering rams... What else do you storm with? (laughs) Storm the Bastille. (laughs) you want to storm the Bastille of of the media with Matilda and Helena... Tune in. Tune in. Every week. What are you most looking forward to? The launch party. No, I'm kidding. It's not. (laughs) The thing I'm most looking forward to is letting people know that what you read in even some of the most well-respected media outlets may not always be the truth. And letting people know that it's okay to be a little bit more critical of that. Mm -hmm. If the news is curated, let's question the curators. I'm so excited that both of you are coming in to say, hey, we also want to be architects of this space. And I'm really looking forward to seeing what kind of Watergate style news stories you break. I am right there with you. Thank you so much for producing this show with the House of the Guilty Feminist. It's a great honour. Likewise. Thank you. Pleasure. It's all mine. Follow Media Storm wherever you get your podcasts so that you can get access to new episodes as soon as they drop. If you like what you hear, share this episode with someone you know and leave us a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts. It really helps more people discover the podcast and our aim is to have as many people as possible hear these voices. You can follow Matilda and Helena on social media at Matilda with an H, Mal, M-A-L-L and at Helena Wadia. And you can follow the show via Media Storm Pod. Media Storm, a new podcast from the House of the Guilty Feminist, is part of the ACOS Creator Network. It is produced by Tom Selinsky and Deborah Francis White. The music is by Samphire. The Guilty Feminist is provided exclusively from ACOS. Find it wherever you get your podcasts.